Hello, second graders of Seattle Public Schools. I'm Miss Keller, and it's so great to be back with you again for these next two weeks. I usually teach at Wing Luke Elementary School, but we're going to work together, and we are all going to do nonfiction wondering. For this lesson, you will need a talk partner. You can either talk with an imaginary friend or a sibling. You could even talk with another family member. You can also choose to speak in your home language anytime we're answering or sharing our thinking. We're going to be working with nonfiction, and that means we're going to be learning true information. What else do you think you know about nonfiction? Maybe you said that it has text features like diagrams or photographs or captions. Maybe you said that it teaches you something. Those are all things that we know about nonfiction. While we're learning about wondering in nonfiction, we're going to go deep into habitats. We have a lot of great habitats in Seattle. A habitat is where something lives. One of those habitats we have are our backyard or parks. And I'm wondering, what kinds of animals can you name whose habitats or homes might be in a backyard or in one of our parks? So one of my friends called in. And they were like, ah, oh, just the other day, I was in my backyard and there was a raccoon. We've learned about raccoons together. That's one of the animals that you might have said were in a park or the backyard. Maybe you said squirrels. But we also know insects are one type of animal you might find in a park here in Seattle or in our backyards. Today, we're going to read Insect Detective by Steve Voke and illustrated by Charlotte Voke. This is published by Candlewick Press. What do you think you know about insects? Go ahead and stop and think. When you're ready, you can share with your partner. Some of you may have shared with your partner that you know that insects are six-legged creatures. You may also know that insects have, might have antenna. Those are some things that you might have shared with your partner. Remember, we wonder before we read, during reading, and after reading. Based on what you know about insects or think you know about insects, what do you wonder about insects? Again, you're going to stop and think. And when you're ready, you may turn to your partner and share your thinking. I asked this question to some of my friends' kids, and this is what they said. I wonder how many insects are in the world. And what do insects eat? We're going to read the first part of our text today, and we're going to ask and answer questions as we go. When we read today, there are, and we talk about the book, there are a few sentence stems that I'd like you to know so you can have a strong conversation and share your thinking. These are our wonder sentence stems. We have, I wonder blank. We have, what? Why? How? When, who, and where. We use these sentence stems when we're asking questions or wondering about a text. If you're sharing your thinking about what you learned from the text, you'll use I learned blank. Okay. Right now, all around you, thousands of insects are doing strange and wonderful things but you can't always see them right away. Sometimes you have to know where to look. This is a caption. This is a text feature of nonfiction. They usually tell more information about the photographs and the main text. This one says, there are more insects living in the world than all the other animals put together. About 200 million insects for every single person. 
Listen, over by the fence, can you hear a scratching sound? A wasp is scraping away at the post with her strong jaws. A post is a part of a fence. Listen, over by the fence, can you hear a scratching sound? A wasp is scratching away at the post with her strong jaws. She's collecting wood. She mixes it into a soft pulp. Pulp is the wet material made from wood. She mixes it into a soft pulp in her mouth. When she has enough, she'll help the other wasps build a nest. That's where insects usually live. When she has enough, she'll build a nest out of paper with the other wasps. Not all kinds of wasps live together, but many of them do. This caption says, insects that live together are called social insects. Ants always live together. They usually make their nests underground. Finding an ant's nest is easy. First, find an ant. Then, follow it. It might stop to chat with some other ants. That means talk. It might stop to chat with some other ants along the way. Ants can communicate by touching their antenna together. Antenna are thin rods on their head used for smelling and feeling. So they might stop to chat by communicating with touching their antenna together. But after a while, the ant will be head home and you'll be able to find out where it lives. There it goes. This caption says, like all insects, ants have three main body parts, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. An abdomen is the rear part of the body. The thorax is the middle. Okay. I'm wondering, what did you learn about social insects? Go ahead and stop and think. And when you're ready, share with your partner. Scholars, you might have shared about how the ants communicate with each other using their antenna. Or you may have talked about wasps working together to make their nest. Solitary bees live by themselves. Solitary means alone. This female solitary bee is busy collecting food from spring flowers. She'll store it in her tiny nest so that it will be ready for when her eggs hatch. To hatch means to break open for young insects to be born. And this caption says, all insects' life start as eggs. Solitary bees make their nests in holes in the ground, cracks in walls, or in tiny cavities, the cavity is a hole, or in tiny cavities that have been left by other insects. you just learn about solitary bees? Stop and think. And when you're ready, go ahead and turn to your partner. Maybe you shared that you learned that they make a nest in a cavity, which is a small hole. We could have also talked about how they are, they collect food from the spring flowers to put into their nest. Many animals like to eat insects for dinner. So some insects use camouflage. That means something color or shape that protects an animal from attack by making it difficult to see. So this bug is camouflaged to this leaf. I actually thought this was the bug. <laughs> That's the bug. Many animals like to eat insects for dinner. So some insects use camouflage to blend in with their surroundings. Look at this crinkly brown leaf. Can you see a crinkly brown herald moth too? They often rest in trees during the day so that birds won't see them. Insects have other ways of hiding too. See the squiggly lines on these leaves?
They were made by a leaf miner caterpillar. The leaf miner protects itself by living between the top and the bottom layers of leaves. That means it, it lives in between. A bit like hiding in a sandwich. Lift up a stone and you might see an earwig scuttle out. They like to hide in the damp and the dark. The pinchers, the claws, or the body parts for, used for gripping and holding things. Right there's the pinchers of the earwig. The pinchers on the tips of their abdomens make them look kind of scary, but don't worry, they're completely harmless. This caption says, female earwigs are very good mothers. They work hard to keep their eggs clean, turning and washing them regularly. When the young hatch, their mothers bring them food until they're old enough to look after themselves. When the author writes female earwigs are very good mothers, what reasons or examples does he give to support that idea? And feel all your brains working so hard. Go ahead and turn to your partner. One reason the author gives that they're very good mothers is in the captions. That's why it's so important to look at the captions because they give you more information about the text, right? It says, they're good mothers because they keep their eggs clean. They wash them regularly. Those are some examples. I'm going to ask you some questions to discuss with your partner. We're going to pause on our story, our text today, and we're going to come back to it in our next lesson. I want you to think about, what did you learn about insects from this book that interested or surprised you? Go ahead and turn to your partner and share. You're going to use this stem now. I learned life. When I asked this question to my friends, they said something that surprised them was that the leaf miner caterpillar lives between the layers of the leaf. None of us knew that. What a strange place to live. Something else that we learned that surprised us is that ants use their antenna to communicate. Were any of your wonderings explained in the first part of this book? Looking at our chart, we have together. I wonder how many insects are in the world and what do insects eat? We got this one, right? I wonder how many insects are in the world because in the text it says. There are more insects living in the world than any other, all, than all of the other animals put together. About 200 million insects for every single person. So while it didn't tell us how many there are in the world, it did tell us that there are very, very many insects in the world. I'm also wondering, what else are you wondering about insects now that we've begun the book? And think, and you're going to use these wondering stems to help your, your thinking. I wonder what. Go ahead and when you're ready, turn to your back. Some additional wonderings that you might have might be, 
I wonder if my leaf miner caterpillars ever come out of the leaves again after they got inside them. That's a very curious wondering. Or what types of insects swim? These were all ones that are underground. What about if they swim? In our next lesson, we're going to continue reading this text and we'll be looking for answers to those questions as well. Before I send you to do some work for reading on your own, I want to go over a couple words from today's reading. The first word is teamwork. Say teamwork. Teamwork. Great. On this page, the wasp works with the others to build a nest out of paper or wood pulp. When you work together, that's called teamwork. In this picture, the people are working together to build the robot. They're working together to get something done. That's called what class? That's right, teamwork. I'm wondering how you've been using teamwork while you've been at home with your families. For example, my family and I work together to do the dishes after we make a meal and eat it. I'm going to give you a scenario or a situation and I want you to think, is that showing teamwork or not? For example, Helping your brother or sister clean their bedroom. Are you using teamwork? Why or why not? Go ahead and share with your partner. One of the answers I heard was that it was showing teamwork because it's more than one person working to get the bedroom done and then you might get to go play outside when you're done. So you were working together to get it done. What about if you were drawing by yourself? That's showing teamwork. Why or why not? and turn to your partner. I don't think that's teamwork because you're not working with others like our friends here to get something done. You're just doing it alone. One more. You were building a sand castle at the beach with your family. Is that showing teamwork? Why or why not? Go ahead and turn to your partner now. I got a surprising answer. So I disagreed with this, but that's okay to disagree with. As long as you share your thinking clearly. This person said, they didn't think it was teamwork if they weren't all building one sandcastle part together. If they were each working on a different part of the sandcastle, they're kind of working together to get it done. But it'd be more teamwork if they were all working on the same part together to get that part done and then moving on to the next part together. So they're communicating. I thought, I disagree. I thought that it's teamwork if you're just building a sandcastle together. It doesn't matter what part of the sandcastle you're working on, as long as you're doing it together to get it done. But I was kind of convinced the other way, too. That makes a lot of sense. All right, these scholars. Our other word we have today is damp. Can you say damp? Say it to the ceiling. Damp! Say it in a deep voice down to your feet. Damp! Damp means a little bit wet. Not very wet, just a little bit wet. In our picture here, 
this person is hanging their clothes up to dry after they washed them. And they're still a little bit wet, so they're still a little damp. In our text, earwigs like to be in a damp place, so not very wet, just a little bit wet, like under a rock. I'm going to give you another scenario, and I want you to think if this is damp or not. When you get out of the shower, and your hair, after you put the towel on it, is it damp or not? Soaking wet, maybe? It's very wet. My hair, right after I step out of the shower, is blank. Try that with me. My hair, right after I step out of the shower, is blank. Turn to your partner. My friend phoned in, and they said, after you put a towel on it, my hair after I get out of the shower is damp. It's not soaking wet because it's had a little bit of chance for the towel to soak up the moisture. If I haven't put the towel on it yet though, it's soaking wet. It's still dripping. Thanks for learning with me today, scholars. Before you go, I'm going to give you some work to do so that you can keep growing that brain of yours. You're going to get a Just Right book that is nonfiction. Now when I get a nonfiction book, the first thing I do is I preview it. That means I look to see what it might be about. So I read the cover, and I look at the photograph, I look at the back, sometimes it tells me about the text, sometimes it doesn't and it might show me a photograph, and I kind of scan through the few pages to see what text features it has, if it has any that interest me. So I see that this one has Captions and photographs. <gasps> it has a diagram. I love diagrams. So then I look through that. I read the headings, facts. I need food. And I think, is this a book that would interest me? And I think this book might be about chipmunks and give me information about chipmunks and how they grow up. Not interesting. So then, I'm going to read a little bit. Baby chipmunks. A chipmunk is a mammal. Mammals have hair or fur on their bodies. A chipmunk has fur covering its body. Mammal babies are born. They come out of their mother's bodies. Baby chipmunks are called kits, pups, cubs, or just baby chipmunks. Baby chipmunks are born in litters of two to eight babies. A litter is two or more babies born at the same time. The, the babies are born without fur. They are blind and tiny. Their ears are closed. They cannot see or hear until they are about one month old. And my caption says, Mammal mothers make milk for their babies. The milk is made in their bodies. Drinking mother's milk is called nursing. These baby chipmunks are nursing. So I'm going to stop. Then I'm going to write about my reading. When I wrote about my reading, I said my book is Baby Chipmunks. And then I wrote my prediction about what I think the book is about. I think this book will be all about chipmunks from baby facts to their habitat. And then I put two wonderings that I had just from that page. I wonder how long chipmunks nurse. And I wonder why babies are born without fur. That way, when I go back the next day, I can look for information that answers these questions. Scholars, you're ready. Go get your texts. Go get your journal and start reading. Have a great rest of your day.